On Larry King Now, you know her as Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. It's Cassandra Peterson. They see Elvira as kind of a hero, uh, which is such a weird, unlikely character, but someone who definitely doesn't fit in with the crowd, doesn't even fit in her dress, actually. Uh, <laughs> but she can suddenly, um, she, she just powers through it. She doesn't pay any mind to what people say or what they do. What makes horror work? I think horror is like an addiction a little bit. It's like a it's like a roller coaster ride. You you have the ups and the downs. You ha, you have a scary moment and then you relax and then another scary moment. Favorite villain. Vincent Price, hands down. Uh, he was the best. I, I interviewed him I, twice. Wasn't he brilliant and funny? Plus music icon Pat Boone. And you're still singing, right? Still singing, played recording. Vegas. Played two nights in Las Vegas, sold out at the Suncoast. Hotel. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. I recently sat down with two industry legends. The first, Cassandra Peterson, the woman behind the timeless Halloween character, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Cassandra, of course, brought Elvira to life in the early 80s and has since turned the Mistress of the Dark into massively successful movies, gaming, books, and costume franchises. She now documents the 35th anniversary of Elvira's creation in a new special edition book entitled Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. It's available on tweeterhead.com. And stick around, because later I'm joined by singer and actor Pat Boone. How'd you become Elvira? I was in the Groundlings comedy improv group, and I heard about um, an interview they were doing looking for a horror hostess. And I was very much into horror, but I really didn't know what a horror hostess was. I came from Kansas. We, we were too poor to have horror hosts. <laughs> Where were the then. Groundlings? Where were uh, they? The Groundlings were on Melrose Avenue at that time. Oh, right here. And, yeah, and they they um, were like the premier uh, comedy improv group in in the country. And uh, I went to see one of their shows. I'm like, this is what I want to do. So I got into the Groundlings and spent about four and a half years there until I heard about this. Um, gig hosting horror movies. And it wasn't like, oh, yay, I've made it, because I was getting $300 a week to uh, host these really crappy, uh, I mean, classic <laughs> horror films there. And it um, sounded like a good deal, you know, pay a little bit of the rent, and uh, ended up taking over my life. Just and, and did they let you ad-lib a lot around the movies? I, I, did, I did most of my ad-libbing while I wrote it. I wrote it with the director and, a, and a, another groundling, John Paragon. And we wrote it uh, sitting in a little booth watching the movie and coming up with whatever jokes we could. So we wrote it all out. So we didn't have much time to ad-lib because they shot my show between the 12 o'clock news and the 5 o'clock news. And if you didn't get the show shot within that time, you were just out of luck. There was no show that week. So we really had to clip along fast. So you became, did you do other things or you became Elvira, Elvira, and that was it? That was it. Once I started this, I... I mean, I thought it was going to be something that I would just do, oh, you know, great, I have this Elvira gig and I look so different, nobody will know me, now I can go out and get real acting work. And that never happened. <laughs> what did it do to the life of Cassandra? Well... I mean, did you have a regular life? Did you get married? Did you have children? You have... I had just gotten married about two weeks before, which is kind of sad uh, because we got divorced and... Uh, uh, he owns part of the characters. He does. <laughs> so bad timing, bad timing. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we had just gotten married two weeks before, and uh, first thing that happened was that back then you had your phone number listed in the phone book, you know? So I was Cassandra Peterson with my home phone number. And immediately after that show aired, calls started coming in, morning, noon, and night, all night long. And... Uh, Obviously, I had to have my phone taken, you know, phone number well, taken out of there. But, yeah, I knew right away, uh-oh, I'm on to something. You say, I'm proud to say that Elvira has become an unlikely role model to many of her fans. She may be a misfit, but she never lets it slow her down. It's well, true. It, it, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of my fans, uh, I think, grew up feeling the same way I did, not fitting in with the crowd, being kind of a loner, outsider, and they see Elvira as kind of a hero, uh, which is such a weird, unlikely <laughs> character, but someone who 
definitely doesn't fit in with the crowd. Doesn't even fit in her dress, actually. Uh, <laughs> but she can suddenly, um, she, she just powers through it. She doesn't pay any mind to what people say or what they do. She just keeps right. going. And The book is out. Is she yeah. appearing anywhere Halloween? She is appearing at Halloween at Not Scary Farm, which is uh, here in Southern California, the largest oh, oh, horror venue yeah. in the country. For what Halloween. do you do there? I sing and dance and tell jokes. I have a big, gigantic production show there, musical uh, wow. show. Wow. Yeah, it's does, fun. Does, does you do your own makeup? I do. I, I do my own makeup. Uh, I had other people do it over the years, and just it'd come out different every time. Sometimes better, sometimes worse, but. I finally just said, ah, I'll just do it myself. What makes horror work? I think horror is like an addiction a little bit. It's like a, it's like a roller coaster ride. You, you have the ups and the downs. You, ha you have a scary moment, and then you relax. And then another scary moment comes. And I think it's really a, almost like a drug thing in your head. The dopamine or the, 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 the hormones that are in your brain give you this rush. What movie did Elvira make? I made Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. It was my first movie, and I made a second one, Elvira's Haunted Hills. And uh, uh, I'm very proud of both those movies. I made the second one with my own money. Don't ever do that, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little show business advice. Um, and, but the first one has become kind of a cult classic. I'm really happy to say it's... it's it wasn't big when it was released, but it's become very much of a staple for Halloween. Is it on Turner Classic Movies? It has been. Yes, it has been on there. What does uh, Cassandra do when it's not Halloween? I actually run a business, and it's the Elvira business. I do licensing and merchandising. I go out there and look for products. I do um, my next uh, big job, whatever it's going to be, if it's working on this book or it's getting an animation uh, television show prepared, that's what I'm doing right now. But I work nonstop so doing this, uh, appearances this, and things all year this round. This is a franchise. It is a big franchise. So I can book you, right? You can. How did this book come about? Oh. Cassandra, look at this. Oh, whoa. Whoa, 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 a little oh, playboy whoa. here. <laughs> what? Um, just so many years of doing Elvira, 35 years, um, I have a lot of photos, as you can imagine, stuck away in storage units. And uh, it's a project I've always wanted to do, display the photos from the beginning of the character. There I am, uh, pregnant. I was even doing <laughs> Elvira while I was pregnant. Um, but all these photos that the fans have never really gotten to see, uh, from behind the scenes of my movie and my television show. Is there a written and copy, too? There's a little written copy. Um, mostly it's pictures, which is awesome. You don't have to know how to read to enjoy it. <laughs> More with Cassandra Peterson when we return. I'm told it's not well known, but before Elvira, you were in a Federico Fellini movie? I was. I had how did that come about? I, after I, I was a showgirl in Las Vegas, I moved over to uh, Italy, and I was living in Rome, and literally walked down the street, saw Federico Fellini shooting the movie Roma, <laughs> uh, got to meet him. He thought I looked like his wife when she was young, Giulietta Messina, and he offered me to be in a, a role in the movie. What did you do? I was several things. I was really an extra, is all, but I was... I played a hooker, speaking of hookers, I played uh, a, um, in a 1930s bordello, I played a student in a student riot, I played a motorcycle gang girl, and the great thing about it was I got to work for 30 days with Fellini, meet a lot of incredible people, and uh, it was an experience of a lifetime. What was he like? So sweet and kind, and I didn't speak Italian at the time, so he would yell the directions to everyone in Italian, and then he would walk over to me and say, Cassandra, this is what you're going to do now. <laughs> and he was, he was kind of this jolly, happy guy. I, I always thought of him as a big, kind of scary, freaky person, but he was just very happy and jolly. And All right, we have some questions for you. Uh, if you only knew, I just throw some things uh -oh. at you. Okay. Funniest fan encounter. What's the funniest thing ever happened to Elvira with a fan? Showing me their Elvira tattoo, and which entailed them pulling their pants down. It was scary. <laughs> At Knott's Berry Farm, what will you do? I do a big dancing, singing show. I do song parodies and tell jokes and dance my little heart out. They get a big crowd there. I, I, I do. I perform to 3,500 people a night. How many shows do you do? Two shows a night. For a week? Uh, for a month and a half. 
for six weeks. I started Whoa. I started in September. Doing September it now. Second, yep. Favorite horror movie of all time? I'm going to go with House on Haunted Hills from the 50s. It starred Vincent Price, and it was the movie that, as a child, got me into liking horror. Favorite villain? Vincent Price, hands down. Uh, he was the best. I, I interviewed him I, twice. Wasn't he brilliant and funny? Any favorite contemporary horror movie? Favorite contemporary horror movie? I, I have a harder time with contemporary horror movies because of all the blood and guts and the realism. The, How about the, the zombie television? That, that I love. I'm a giant Walking Dead fan. And there's a lot of blood and guts in that. But somehow, maybe the small screen makes it a little more palatable. If Elvira could marry another famous horror character, who would she marry? Well, that would be Vincent Price again. I know he's not around, but I would still marry him. <laughs> Ever <laughs> trick you dead. ever played to scare someone? Yeah, I've done a lot of tricks. Where, well, one night on Halloween night, I opened the door dressed as Elvira, and there was a little gaggle of kids out there. And I think those kids are grown up now, and they're still in shock. Been to haunted houses? Oh, yeah, a million of them. A million of them. I live what, in haunted houses. What do you give out to trick-or-treaters? More than a handful, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> If not Elvira, what would you be doing, do you think? I think I would be, uh, you know, I've often thought about this. I always wanted to be in show business, but if I got completely out of show business, I think maybe a precision car driver. I love driving. I love, I love... You're quite a character, Cassandra. You have children? <laughs> I do. I have one daughter, 21 years old. What does she do? She's a musician. She plays guitar. She's great. Stranded on a desert island, what three things does Elvira bring with her? <laughs> um, lipstick, hairspray, <laughs> and condoms. <laughs> well, nobody else is there, though. And last but not least, your proudest accomplishment? Probably being a character well, you that people a, look up to. You've made a character famous. You ought to be I very am. proud of that. I, I am, I am. We have, we have some fan Developing questions for you. Uh -oh. Some quick ones. A I, Patrick on Facebook. How does it feel to be worshipped as a goddess by generations of men and women? Well, I don't know. Ask me later. Um, uh, <laughs> it feels pretty good, I guess. Wow. At David Presley on Twitter. In what ways is Cassandra like Elvira? I guess I am a little more like Elvira. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty ballsy I uh, and Elvira's. <laughs> Are you more like her as the years go by? I am. In the beginning, I didn't think I was like her at all. And now I'm starting to realize I am getting more and more like her. Fal Gunnar on Twitter. What was the real Elvis like? You had a date with Elvis? I did. He was fantastic. And he actually, um, the best thing about Elvis, I, I mean, I worship Elvis, but he gave me some advice about show business, and I think if it wouldn't have been for him, he told me, I was the youngest showgirl in Las Vegas when I was 17, and he told me to get out of Vegas. He said, it's not a place for a 17-year-old girl. Where did you go on the date? Oh, we went to his hotel. <laughs> but it was a party. It was a party. I was 17. I was underage. There was no, really not much hanky-panky going on there. Well, he had people watching him, like from every corner, everywhere. I think they were worried about, a, 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 you know, some kind of a underage paternity Jenny suit. Newman wants to know if you ever get tired of playing her. I don't ever get tired of playing her. I get tired of putting on the makeup, I must say that. But I don't get tired. Once I'm in the costume, I love it. Christopher Hunt on Facebook, you still keep up with the groundlings? I do. I see them often. I show up at various uh, benefits for them. and I. Uh, some of my best friends in my life are, are groundlings. Uh, Michael Payoff on, on Facebook. Does Cassandra enjoy any elements of the Gothic lifestyle in her personal life? You know, strangely, I used to. I had a house that kind of looked like I was uh, in the Adams family, and I sort of got over that. And now I live in a house that looks more like a Leave it to Beaver. And Victor Abru on Facebook also asks, do people like to compare your style to that of Cher? Do you agree? I do. I feel like I have a little in common with Cher. We're, we're both tough uh, yeah, you women are. and sexy, and that's a good thing to be like, right? Thank you, doll. Thanks. And my thanks to guest Cassandra Peterson. Be sure to pick up a copy of her new book, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, available now on tweeterhead.com. And when we come back, we'll be joined by musical legend Pat Boone. Don't go away. Welcome back to Larry King Now. Joining us now, Pat Boone, man of many talents and titles, best known as singer, composer, actor, and record executive. And according to Billboard, he has sold over 45 million albums in his career and charted 38 top 40 hits. And now Pat's back with the re-release of a special collection of songs 
honoring law enforcement officers in America, and the audio version of the classic book, God's Promises for Your Every Need, which was released 35 years ago. So two things <laughs> happening at once. Your selection of songs were written for law enforcement officers. When was that released? Well, it, it's just now been released as a group of songs. I did it for the U.S. Deputy Sheriff's Association, a wonderful group that uh, supports law enforcement in smaller communities who don't have the budgets of big cities. <clears throat> so quite often they don't have as good modern equipment, they don't have as much training. And so U.S. Deputy Sheriffs fills that gap. And so I had recorded these songs over the last 20 years, going back to when Two Live Crew and other groups, I think NWA and some of these rap groups, were actually singing and recording lyrics that urged their followers to kill police, off the pigs, all of these things that were in their lyrics. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, who are you going to call when somebody breaks into your house, steals your car, shoots through your windows, you're going to call a rap group to help you out? Or are you going to call those men and women in blue who won't ask what color you are or what race? They'll come racing to try to help you. So I wrote songs to the humanize like the police. titles like Part of America Died, He'll yep. Never Walk Alone, Won't Be Home Tonight. Yep, and that's the story of a policeman and his wife at the beginning of the day and takes him through the day while he's getting ready for a drug bust that night. And he says, won't be home tonight for dinner, darling. You and the kids can make it on your own. Little bud can say the grace like I do. When I get my work done, I'll be home. And, uh, and so mm. she's home washing dishes, wishing out loud her man was not a cop. The day goes along in the course of the song. At stumbling out of bed after midnight, she takes the call. He's not going to be coming home. Mm. And uh, he won't be home for dinner from then on. And the empty uniform is about the clothes hanging in the closet that belonged to the man. Can't we get along is from the famous line, though. From Rodney King. Yeah. And I, that is an anthem. But that was police not doing right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they beat the poor guy <laughs> nearly to death, even though he was resisting and, on, and high, yes. But when he stood in front of the press, as you remember, he could have said some inflammatory things and set off a whole new set of L.A. riots. Instead, and it, I tear up now even thinking, he says, in that cracked voice and the head still puffy, can't we get along? Can't now, I we know just you, be friends? And that's what that song is. Police, you, you say, have gotten a bad rap. Yep. But the thing that started was police doing some pretty wrong yes, things. Yes, yes, they have. And that's, that is a matter of, of stark, horrible fact. They've been impulsive sometimes. They, see, we speak, the problem is we speak collectively as if it's all police. It's not. It's out of the thousands and thousands of men in blue, there are those who act impulsively like that woman who's going to go to jail probably, who shot the guy in the back. Yeah. And, and First rule, you never shoot in the back. And, you know, the police have got to be trained to shoot to cripple, not kill. And today, if they have to shoot. Today, now you have the iPhone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, iPhones. So how much of this must have gone on we've never seen? Yeah, oh, definitely. There's no, no hiding or, or try, denying that the many police have done things that are that are that are wrong and sometimes because of the pressure and yes some actually are prejudiced but collective and the, the whole bunch of police without them we have no society <laughs> and so we've got to train them better and we've got to be compassionate and they've got to hold off and not shoot <laughs> unless they absolutely have to but the ones well, in Dallas were protecting the black lives matter parade yeah. They need retraining in a lot of ways. Yep, areas. yep, yep, better training. I know you've, you're very conservative, very political. Yeah. Isn't this race disturbing <laughs> to you? Come on, Pat. I, Larry, I've written a couple of columns for World Net Daily and Newsmax, uh, and I'm quoting Mae West. <laughs> First of all, you know, we're faced with two candidates that the majority of, of eligible voters don't like either one and they're going to have to choose one or the other, or the independents who can't win. So I quote Mae West. I've never quoted Mae West before. <laughs> but she said, when I have to choose between two evils, I like to go with the one I haven't tried yet. We've got two possible evils, I mean, as far as many voters are concerned. One we know very, very well after 30 years. We know what she will do, the kind of judges she will appoint if she has that opportunity. But the taxes and that, all the you, things. You should vote for. If you if you think that, <laughs> that the liberal point of view like that 
to be perpetuated into who knows how long, then of course vote for her. But even 70% of women say she's not trustworthy, but they'll vote for her anyway, mainly because she's a woman, they don't like Trump. Trump, I'm comparing to Truman, not Reagan. Remember Truman was oh. blunt? When my, I was a little kid when but I remember Harry my was parents- But Harry was a hell of a senator. Oh, well, but, but his, he was not a president or nobody thought of him, but then Roosevelt died, one of the great presidents of all time, and my parents were saying, this haberdasher from Kansas City is our president, we're doomed. Well, Harry Truman was blunt, sometimes profane. He did things against his counselor's advice, including um, uh, dropping the atomic bomb, firing the national hero, MacArthur, because he was not respecting authority, and then finally recognizing Israel, the new nation of mm -hmm. Israel, which all of his advisors wanted him not to do. And remember little Jacobson, I think is, what was his, was it Harry or Ben Jacobson anyway, his partner in the store mm -hmm. back in Kansas City came to see him and said, remember what the Bible says, God loves Israel. You've got to represent, you've got to support Israel. And just behind closed doors, Truman made that decision based on biblical Truth, But because of your feelings and your strong Christian feelings, Donald Trump can't be your favorite kind of no, guy. No, <laughs> no. In fact, he knows it. I've talked to him. I've known him a long time. And I, I, I said to him during the nominating process, I said, Donald, if you would quit calling names, quit calling your opponents names, get a tape of Reagan when he was debating Mondale and uh, and no. Jimmy Carter, he could state his case very firmly, sometimes with a little humor, but with respect for the opponent. And he seemed more likable and more presidential. I'll bet, I said, I'll bet your own wife is counseling you this way. And he laughed. He is impulsive. He, when he's out there on the stump, people cheer him on and he says these improvident things. But he's also an executive and he knows what he doesn't know and he's gonna appoint people, if he's elected, who do know <laughs> what he needs Were to know. Were you a little disappointed in his debate performance? Oh, terribly, because he... He didn't try, you know, he, he missed the opportunity, he didn't prepare. And she, of course, did prepare, because she's a thorough professional. The founding fathers did not have professional politicians in mind for our government. They wanted business people, lawyers, doctors, uh, farmers to come in, represent the people that, for a while, and they go back to their professions and not settle down for 30, 40 years and become wealthy in Congress. <laughs> and hmm. So Tom, uh, Trump is nobody, well, I say nobody's favorite. There are millions of us that, that are, don't consider him the, the best candidate. But then on the other hand, neither is the other. And so we're all going to vote. We're all going to vote, either for one candidate or the other, or in not voting, as some Republicans have said, they're, they're voting for whoever wins. And some uh, Bernie Sanders people aren't yeah, going to vote? Yeah, yeah. In our final moments, we'll take a look at Pat Boone's remarkable career. We'll play a little game with him of If You Only Knew Too. Don't go away. Pat Boone, now we've got the collection God's Promises for Your Every Need. Family Learning for Christian Living. This came out a long time ago. It did, about 35 years ago. Is this new package? New package, and Shirley and I, you know Shirley. Of course. And of course. We both love you and Sean and your kids, and I was there for your birthday in Dodger State. That's, mm -hmm. We go back. But, um, but, but we did those over 2,000 verses of the Old Testament, New Testament, and I tell people every verse was written by Jews, for Jews, and about Jews, what we call the New Testament which Gentiles picked up on, was written by and for Jews. And so this is right from the mouth and spirit of God, all his promises to us. There's 2,000 or more of them on every topic you can think of, every need we can think of. And Shirley and I went in a, well, actually we didn't go in a studio, we did them at home and on cassettes then, now they're on CDs. But we read all of these promises everybody's needs, no matter what they are, God's made promises for people he loves and we present him as our daddy, our father. And I know this is something you grapple with oh, because yeah. as you're just honest and say, well, for this Jewish kid from Brooklyn, it's never quite connected. I don't know. <laughs> but, but in the Bible, he is presented as our father and the, and the New Testament says we can even address him as Abba, father, the Jewish word for fa daddy, daddy. He loves us all, 
but he's going to take care of his kids first. Where his is family. he at? He's in, in his heavenly realms. He's everywhere, actually, because mm -hmm. we believe he's omnipresent, uh, omniscient. He knows everything. He's everywhere. But he looks after his kids, especially those who seek him and identify with him. So, so when your grandson, yeah. So we oh, were and you were so good to us. And he fell through a whole pane of glass. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a skylight, skylight 40 feet above it. the floor of the building. He was 25. He's now 40. Yeah. Didn't you doubt a loving God then? Because no. if he's omnipotent, he could have prevented he the could fall. He could have, yes. And, and these, there were questions. Why? Because we, we're not blaming him, but we're saying, like any kid would his father, why did you do that? Mm. Well, he, he could have stopped it. But it's something Ryan did. He was not careful stepping on that skylight, which wouldn't support him. And there was nothing to warn him, no guardrail. And so this is something he did. Now, God didn't give him up. Doctors didn't think he would live through the night, as you know. And you orchestrated prayer throughout the world. Even uh -huh. people were, were letting you know they put pieces of paper at the wailing wall for yeah. Ryan. And you let me come on four times. The last time Ryan was there mm -hmm. with you, sitting in the chair, laughing at what you said. And even though doctors said he would never eat, think, do anything, he was softly saying the Pledge of Allegiance with under God in it mm -hmm. and laughing. And faint voice. Now, you'll see some videotapes on Facebook and all over the place. Yesterday, he walked across the finish line with his dad and brother helping, but he was making the steps, walking over at 6'4", the, the finish line of a 10K, 5K run that raised uh, thousands and thousands of dollars for other families with brain injured loved ones. And he has come so far beyond what the doctors thought. And our prayers are being answered. That's why I want you to see the tape because you, yeah, I'm gonna you let me come on and ask the world to pray for our grandson. Well, that was and such. That those was... prayers are being answered. Dramatic. That was a great moment. So you believe in prayer. Oh boy, yes. <laughs> when you see all the wrongs in the world, what don't you ever doubt your faith? No, because this is a broken world. And the whole world, unfortunately, either has other concepts of God, and in one case, so the second great religion in the world believes in a violent God who, who calls on his believers to some t eventually kill Jews or Christians. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the kind of God that, that we read about in the Bible. The Bible, God in the Bible. Well, the God, God of the Old Testament could be pretty rough too. Rough, yes, on, particularly on enemies of Israel and even on Israel when they disobeyed. Yeah. He would back away in the, in the days of Samuel the prophet. They would say, we want a king like all the other nations around us. They were rejecting their system of government, the Mosaic covenant. We want a king. And so Samuel said, told, complained to God. God said, Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Captivity. You are a student of the Bible. Oh yeah. Read it. I read through this Bible. It's a one year Bible, of course, several versions. This is the New Living Translation. But it's in 365 portions of Proverbs, Psalms, Old Testament, New Testament, every and, day. And you're still singing, right? Still singing. Played recording. Vegas? Played two nights in Las Vegas, sold out at the Suncoast Hotel. And I'm going to, uh, Tel Aviv, I was in Tel Aviv the first and only time this March. Great city. And we had a sold out performance in the Man Theater, sold Did out. Go to Jerusalem? Oh, I went to Jerusalem, of course, and, and met privately with Netanyahu. We can give you a picture of our, just he and I, because he too is proud that his son won a Bible, Know Your Bible contest in Israel twice, 18 years old. And he said, my son, and I said, but your dad, Ben Zion, was a Bible scholar. Yes, he was. And he says, he, now this is the Prime Minister of Israel. He says on Saturdays, on Shabbat, I will occasionally, if I have time, I will have some friends over and we study the Bible together on Shabbat. So there is a, a Bible linkage. There is a, a biblical and a God linkage. He, we, are, we are America because Jewish people supported our, our revolution. Pat, great knowing you. Hey, Continues. good to know you. <laughs> Big thanks to my guests, Pat Boone and earlier Cassandra Peterson. Be sure to pick up a copy of the CD set, God's Promises for Your Every Need, available now. And as always, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.